Good morning and welcome to track four, Dam and Levy Planning and Risk Communications. I'm Karen McHugh and I'd like to thank our sponsors for sponsoring this section. This session. I encourage the attendees to submit questions in the chat at the right side of the screen for each presenter. We're going to begin this NFIP track session with a presentation titled Emergency Action Planning for Dams and Other Tools to Communicate Dam Risk. The presenter is Meg Galloway, who is a professional engineer and senior policy advisor for ASFPM. Now, please welcome Meg Galloway. Hello, I'm excited to be here to talk about two of my favorite topics, dams and flood risk. Most of my focus in the presentation will be on dams. However, the concepts usually apply also to levees. The goal of the presentation is to show what tools are available to identify, quantify, and communicate dam risk. And I want to do that through highlighting risk in recent, uh, that happened in recent dam flood events, reviewing key dam data, exploring dam EAPs and the kind of risk information they can provide, giving you some examples of unique state laws that help identify and communicate risk, and finally, how we could use the full authority provided in the National Floodplain Mapping Program to improve the communication of dam and levee risk. This cartoon gets to the heart of the problem. Dams and levees do a lot of good and reduce risk much of the time. But do the people in this cartoon world believe that the Hoover Dam could fail? Or do they know what would happen to the community if it did fail? Dams and levees keep people safe and, until they don't. This complacency disrupts, disrupts lives, costs money, and kills. It's never a good day when you're a dam safety professional to have your dam making national news headlines. I'm going to share quickly share three of the more recent dam events which have garnered national attention and perhaps a little bit of the, the takeaway from them. The first is the Oroville Dam, and that event did a lot to heighten the awareness of the potential consequences of dam failures worldwide. And the forensics report on the failure contained a lot of information. Uh, the two probably, uh, quote, most important for this discussion and to uh, dam safety officials are pointing out the, the fact that um, physical inspections don't tell you everything you need to know about the dam and that you need to go back periodically and have a comprehensive review of all dam information. Also that just because a dam is in compliance doesn't mean that everything's okay. The Oroville Dam was in compliance with state uh, requirements and federal emergency regulatory requirements, yet it, it, it definitely got into trouble. The next case happened the next year, March of 2019, the failure of the Spencer Dam. Uh, this was a time when the whole Missouri, lower Missouri River system was in flood and uh, many of the levees along the system were failed in addition to the Spencer Dam. This dam failed because of severe ice loading conditions on the river, which failed the embankment and downstream, and unfortunately killed someone. The investigative report on this failure came out in April and, and highlighted uh, two communication gaps. One was on uh, potential on warning messages that could be, that could or should be given in the case of an imminent failure and how they're received by the recipient. And the second was the fact that some of the, some information pertinent to the, about the dam that had failed twice um, happened before the state records started keeping track of information on the dam and therefore was not known. The third dam I want to talk about was the most recent and probably fresh in our memories, and that's the failure of the Edenville Dam. Um, there's so much yet to unpack about this event and the lawsuits have, have uh, just started. The big takeaway I have from this 
um, for today's discussion is that 11,000 people actually did heat evacuation warnings. Um, this could have done partially due to the fact that the county had, within the last couple of years, done a full-scale emergency response exercise based on the dam failure. Next, I'd like to move into uh, data on dams. Every state, as well as Puerto Rico, have a dam state program, dam safety program, well, except for Alabama. Each state's laws require you, require, each state's laws are unique. Each state also reports the information, uh, key information about their dams to the National Inventory of Dams. And I'm gonna go through some of that data that helps, uh, can help us understand dam risk. There are currently 91,457 dams in the database and the majority of those are state regulated. As far as what the dams are used for, recreation, flood control, agriculture and wildlife impoundments, irrigation, and water supply are the most common uses. Dam height is a, a, a big indicator in the risk the dam causes. The greater majority of the dams in the country are under 50 feet high and uh, of those, the majority are under 25 feet high. Dam owner type uh, ha has a play in risk too. Um, you can see the majority of the dams are owned either pr privately or by local municipalities. And while it's not always the case, most of these dams do not really provide an income stream for the owner. And therefore there is less money available for upkeep, maintenance, and improvements at the dam. In many cases of privately owned dams, there is one person who is the owner, the operator, the maintenance person, and the EAP coordinator. In order to understand the, the next slide, you need to understand how dam risks are classified. And that this is also a key element to dam risk identification. Terminology can do, vary from state to state, but in general, hazard potential classifications are high if there's a probable loss of life, significant if significant property damage is expected, but no probable loss of life, and low hazard if there's no probable loss of life or probability of significant property damage. One thing to remember is that the hazard classification is based on the existing development downstream of the dam that would be impacted by the failure of the dam and not the condition of the dam. And this is very frequently confused when there is an incident at a dam in the news. Hazard potential, uh, as I said, was a good is a good risk in indicator. When we look at the National Inventory of Dams, the greater majority of the dams are low hazard potential, but a third of the dams are either high, significant, or undetermined potential. Every dam should have plans for inspection, operation, maintenance, and emergency action. The National Dam Safety Program has a goal to have an emergency action plan for all high and significant hazard dams. A lot of good progress on this goal has been made in the last 10 years. However, we can never hit that goal as long as states do not have the authority to require the plans. And as you can see at the bottom of the screen, there are seven states that do not have the authority to require an EAP for a high hazard dam and 19 who do not have that authority for a significant hazard dam. This leaves the regulator to, to try to cajole or guilt the dam owner into creating the plan if they're not willing to do it uh, on their own volition. This says it all. Runford is not an, an adequate emergency action plan. Rather, the plan is a formal document that identifies potential emergency conditions at the dam and the actions that need to be followed to minimize the loss to life and property damage. The EAP 
is unique to each dams. It identifies actions the owner needs to take to address on-site problems, actions of the owner to coordinate with local emergency managers, warning and notification procedures, information on where the water will go and how fast it gets there if the dam fails, and who is responsible for doing what in the plan. Each AAP is unique to the dam and is generally the responsibility of the dam owner to create the AAP. It needs to be coordinated with emergency management managers and other owners downstream. And when you think of the percentage of the dams that are privately owned, this can be a daunting task to a private owner. So many states and agencies had developed their own uh, guidelines or templates for EAPs. However, in 2013, FEMA published the National EAP uh, Guidelines for Dam Safety, Emergency Action Planning for Dams. And this is a helpful starting place for any entity who wants to develop an EAP and over time should improve consistency with any EAPs on the state and national level. An EAP that's been developed can't sit on the shelf. It needs to be updated and exercised. Updating should be done at a minimum annually and any time that there's a change, such as a personnel change, a change in the condition of the dam, or lessons learned from uh, an exercise or an event. Exercising the EAP is also very important and there's two levels of exercise. One is discussion-based, the most common of which is the tabletop exercise, where everyone who has a part in the plan gets together, talks about, talks their way through the plan to identify any problems or needed updates. The other is an operational-based exercise, the most common of which is a functional exercise where people aren't sitting in one room, but they're sitting at their daily job and the exercise happens in real time, and the lessons are learned from how the response went, whether people could actually make, make the response or undertake the actions identified in the plan. Key pieces of risk, valuable risk information are identified and contained within emergency action plans. This includes risk identification, risk awareness, and risk communication. The notification chart is a sequence of calls that are needed to be made to assure proper notification. And if one call is missed, the latter calls don't happen. It's very important in risk communication. Many new tools in the uh, MAPID and GIS world make um, are allowing to make better dam failure inundation mapping with more information, better clarity, and much easier updating than the old marker on the USGS quad that unfortunately are still all we have for many dams. Dam failure inundation mapping should show a visual representation of failure conditions, timing of the failure wave propagation, the depth of the flooding, and the high-risk areas, including homes, critical infrastructure, and critical use facilities. GIS has brought many uh, possibilities to the table to do a wider variety of mapping. The map on the left is an index map with cross-section summary tables that's great in the heat of the event to get information at a, an overview level. The right side are depth grid gradient representations, which again provide a very good, quick visual representation of where the highest risk is, especially with when combined or on top of a, um, a photo layer that shows where structures are. Emergency level uh, designation communicates risk, and the new federal guidelines use imminent failure, potential failure, and non-failure to, com to communicate this. However, older systems at both the state and the federal level 
uh, used other designations, the most common which were one, two, and three, or red, yellow, green. With the new standardization, hopefully over time these will come together, but in any case, the plan always identifies the meaning of the emergency level within the plan. Plans can also contain information related to uh, relating conditions at the dam to the emergency level, as this does. This then leads to other charts, such as what owners, what actions the dam owner could take to moderate or alleviate a problem, and notification procedures based on the potential consequence. One additional chart that is becoming uh, frequent in, in EAPs is a high flow notification. It's a non-failure condition, but it provides information to warn um, first responders, information services, and people downstream of the dam when flow conditions are hit that uh, impact areas downstream of the dam. This chart is is related to emergency notification and messaging. And it's, as you can see in the chart, it's very clear about talking not in danger of failing, potential failure, imminent failure. These are often accompanied by scripts for uh, situations that might be specific to the dam. And this could have potentially helped if there had been an EAP for the Spencer Dam, and if it contained this messaging, it could have, but not necessarily, would surely have helped with the communication of the risk to that homeowner downstream where the dam operators told them, told, stopped and said that the dam was uh, in imminent failure, yet the property owner did not uh, leave the structure in time to get out. Next thing I want to talk about is three state initiatives that, it, that are unique in the way they help identify and communicate risk. The first is in Virginia, where land development regulations require, where available, failure inundation maps, failure inundation areas shown on new plat and subdivision plans. Um, if it's found that this, the development changes the hazard of the dam and therefore it has new capacity requirements, the plan either needs to be changed to remove uh, that need or the developer needs to pay for 50% of the cost of upgrading. This has been an impetus for uh, dam owners to complete dam failure analysis and also in disincentive uh, to develop in hazard areas. The next initiative in Virginia is sort of a non-disclosure disclosure requirement, and it's a buyer beware saying that the seller is making no represent representation with the respect to whether the property is within a dam break inundation zone, and that the purchasers should use their due diligence. So, it doesn't say whether they're in or out of a hazard area, but it makes them aware that there could be a hazard area. California has an actual real estate disclosure requirement that requires the seller, if they don't have an agent, or the seller's agent to disclose whether the property lies within an area of potential flooding shown on a dam failure inundation map. Uh, California has developed a very robust and easy to use map viewer that based on the location or the, the hazard potential of the dam, you can drill down to a specific dam and see an overview of its inundation area. And then in the upper left-hand corner, you can also see you can drill down to property level information. Wisconsin's initiative coordinates the administrative rules for floodplain management and dam design standards. And it makes the hazard rating of the dam dependent on both the existing land use and future land use controls in the inundation area downstream of the dam. It requires a more restrictive regulation in the inundation areas 
downstream of the dams, assuming the dam fails during the 100-year event. So it essentially expands the floodplain regulation from just the that shown on the flood insurance rate maps to the area of the inundation of the dam during the 100-year year event. This has led to uh, preventing uh, development in that inundation area, and it also prevents hazard creep where dam hazard changes because development comes in downstream and it now moves from low to significant or high. This is just a representation of the uh, dam failure maps laid on top of the FIS maps, and you can see in both the cases of the, the floodway and the flood fringe area that there are many places where the dam failure, the extent of the dam failure map is larger than the FIS. Sorry. Each of these measures in these states um, came about through a change in the law or a rule, which is generally not easy to do. There is a federal requirement that's already in place, but underutilized that relates to showing dam and levy risks on firms. Firms are a good place to display risk information, but it only contains certain conditions. Uh, for instance, if you live behind a levy or downstream of a flood control dam, you appear to have a low risk but you may be unaware of the residual risks that structure poses. If you live downstream of any dam, you may not be aware that the failure of the dam may cause a flood larger than if that dam was not there. There are requirements in place to address this knowledge gap. Since 2012, federal law has required FEMA through the National Flood Mapping Program to publish maps that include the areas of residual risk and the areas that could be inundated by the failure of a dam, levee, or flood control structure. So far, only minimal progress has been made to date on this effort, and there does not appear to be a unified uh, path going forward right now. Some of the challenges to that are that, to some of the challenges to the implementation of this are that as right now, there is not guidance for how um, the data would be gathered or included as part of the risk map process. It will also take considerable time to collect already generated information and considerable money to uh, generate new data where it's not available. There's also a concern within the dam safety community about the release of sensitive critical infrastructure information associated with the failure of dams and levees. Dam EAPs contain a lot of good, inf good and valuable risk information and it doesn't help if it stays locked um, in the EAP for only small group to see. Somehow we need to strike a balance between the, uh, the availability of too little or too much risk information from these documents. There are opportunities that are in the works and on the horizon. As we've seen, many states and communities are already creating their own tools to enhance risk identification or communication. There is an, also an effort at the national level to uh, work to have the failure inundation mapping layers for dams and levees available both in the National Inventory of Dams and the National Levy Database. Thank you for your time spent attending this session and for your interest in the topic, one of my favorite topics. As we are seeing every day, the resilience of people is amazing and they just need the best information to make the make informed decisions and also have a sense of humor. I'm happy with the time remaining to try and uh, address any questions you may have, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Meg. We really appreciate your presentation. And we do have several questions. The first one is from Tracy. Are dam inundation maps provided to developers and homeowners 
prior to building and purchasing and where are they found? Okay, um, the inundation map is, is done by the dam owner. And so it's, it's essentially their document. And it really depends upon what state you're in, what might happen with that, and, and also somewhat to the community. As I said in my um, presentation, the dam failure map is part of the emergency action plan. And so in theory, I, I would think you can go to either the dam owner, the emergency management department uh, agency and, and ask to see it though. I know in some cases that that is, they will not release it. So it's, it's really a catch as catch can to, um, to get a hold of that. And as you saw in Virginia, that was part of their special law is to make those maps available at the county level so that the developers could see them and property owners could see them. Okay, thank you. Um, this question is from Eddie uh, Meg, and he asks, is there a grading system for the condition of the dam since the class classification isn't based on that? Yes, there, uh, there is a uh, national system in the National Inventory of Dams and it's called the con Condition Assessment. Um, and the conditions they look at are satisfactory, or are satisfactory, fair, poor, unsatisfactory, and not rated. And since many states did not have um, this type of a, a system until it was required, and I, I can't remember how many years ago, um, there are still our dams that are, are not rated in the system. And this is something that should be checked every, like, like the hazard downstream, it should be checked every time the dam's inspected. Okay, thank you, Meg. And I, I've got a question I think is a good one. Uh, a dam owner is going to be petitioning my county to adopt an ordinance to completely restrict residential development within the inundation area. Do you know of any other local governments in the US that have adopted such an ordinance? As you can see, Wisconsin, Wisconsin had one that was, it's written into the state um, uh, floodplain zoning regulations. I do believe there are municipalities and off the top of my head. Um, I'm not coming up with them. I, I think there may be one out in the Denver area and I thought there was another one down in the, the Southwest part of the country that, that did it. But um, maybe some people will hear that and, <laughs> and, and speak up on it or okay. someone can do some research on it, contact the Association of State Dam Safety Officials and see if, if they have that information. Okay, very good. And Meg, if a downstream area is deemed undevelopable developable by regulation, is that not a taking? This is very similar to uh, the takings issue associated with, with floodplains. Um, the dam failure is mm -hmm. a risk. Uh, it's a flood risk. And uh, I think fairly consistently, the law has said that zoning that area mm -hmm. is, is a reasonable thing to do for public safety. Very good. Okay, and do you have information on dams and levees grants? Well, the, uh, there is a relatively new program uh, from uh, the National Dam Safety Program out of FEMA that is uh, specifically grants uh, to address problems at high hazard dams. And the last year was the first year it was funded. Uh, you would go to your state dam safety agency to find out more about that program. Uh, they're actually in the grant application process right now or just completed it. Okay. And um, Shanna, uh, you've already mentioned, as you know, I believe it was CRS that said the sharing, the sharing, uh, sharing the dam safety and info on flood maps outweighs the sensitivity concerns. I agree with Shane, totally. Very good. All right, we've had some really good questions. 
And I think we've about covered them all. Great. I really enjoyed uh, talking to everyone today. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Meg. Cody. Hello, my name is Joe Walm. I am a water resources engineer at Barr Engineering Company in Minneapolis, Minnesota. For the past nine years, I've been working on the Mouse River Enhanced Flood Protection Plan. Today, I'd like to talk about Minot's Road to Recovery, a Section 408 success story. A brief overview of the presentation today. I'll start with Minot's flood history. I'll talk about the 2011 flood that resulted in the flood risk reduction plan that we've been working on since the flood. I'll talk about funding mechanisms, coordination and permitting with FEMA and the Corps of Engineers, and wrap up with a discussion of project status. As with any large project, there are lots of different stakeholders. At the state and regional level, we have the North Dakota State Water Commission, Sewer Server Joint Board, both key players in this. We also are working with Saskatchewan Water Security Agency, the different counties, Department of Transportation. At the federal level, the Corps, FEMA, HUD, Fish and Wildlife Service, Locally, City of Minot, that's the focus of today's presentation, but there are other cities in the area that were affected and will be uh, beneficiaries of this larger project. And we also have to deal with some private entities, most notably the, the two railroads that pass through town. Minot is in North Central, North Dakota. The Mouse River is, or Souris River, it's, as it's known in Canada and by the federal government, flows from Saskatchewan down into North Dakota through Minot and then back up into Manitoba. Like many communities in the United States, Minot has a history of flooding. The earliest recorded flood was in 1881. At that point, they didn't have a way to measure flow, but they did get a, a stage measurement. Subsequently, there were floods in 1904, 69, and 76. In the 1930s, during the Great Depression, a dam, several dams were constructed, most notably the, the Lake Darling Dam upstream of Minot, but several downstream as well. Other dams were constructed since then in 1957. The Boundary Dam was constructed in Canada. After the 69 flood, the Corps of Engineers initiated a federal project that constructed levees and did channel modifications. And then in 1994, the Rafferty and Alameda dams are constructed. And the United States has worked with Canada to, to buy flood storage in those three dams. Within Minot, the Corps' federal project from the 70s consists of levees, the yellow lines show the, the levee center line for that project. <clears throat> there are also channel modifications and ponding areas constructed as, as part, of, part of that effort. Ponding areas are these old abandoned oxbows. This map shows the reservoirs in the Mouse River watershed that are key to managing flood risk for the communities. Three upstream reservoirs in Saskatchewan, the Lake Darling Dam upstream of Minot. Other communities that were affected by the 2011 flood are Burlington, Sawyer, and Belva. So in 2011, each spring, the reservoirs are drawn down to make room for flood events to, to absorb that, that runoff and provide that flood storage, and that happened as usual. However, it was a wet spring, and flood forecasts were high. 
in May, we got up over the 1% chance event. We were in that five to 7,000 CFS range. At one point, citizens were evacuated from town. Eventually, though, the, the flood started to subside. Residents were allowed back in. And then in mid-June, seven inches of rain fell. And at that point, there had been so much water early on in the season that the reservoirs were full. All three Canadian reservoirs and Lake Darling were full. They didn't have any flood storage. So any water coming into those reservoirs had to be passed through downstream. So here's the hydrograph for that spring. Starting in early mid-April, we get up near that 100 year flood event, 5,000 CFS tapers off, but they keep getting events. They thought they were out of the woods here when, when that rainstorm hit and 27,000 CFS came down through the valley. So here's aerial view of Minot. The system has been designed or was designed for 5,000 CFS, which would contain it within that channel through town. With 27,000 CFS, the community was uh, overrun. There was one area in the north of Minot that stayed protected. This red line was an emergency levee but the rest of town, the levees were not big enough to withstand the flood. Six schools were inundated, <clears throat> over 11,000 people were displaced, 200 businesses. Their drinking water supply was threatened. At one point they did have to do a boil water order, but fortunately their, their drinking water treatment plant was, was spared. Over 4,000 homes damaged, the zoo animals were displaced. Here in, in St. Paul we had had some of the, the zoo animals from Minot were temporarily <clears throat> brought here. Most of the bridges through town and in the surrounding community were closed or overtopped. Only two bridges remained open, the Broadway Bridge and the 83 Bypass Bridge. <clears throat> all in all, it was over a billion dollars in damages. This is video from the 2011 flood event. We just saw releases from one of the upstream reservoirs. And here is, is footage of some of the residential communities that were impacted by, by the flood. This slide shows a timeline from the 2011 flood event to uh, and the subsequent studies and design and permitting and construction that has happened for Minot and the surrounding communities. The rest of the presentation will highlight some of these major items, including work done with FEMA, the Corps of Engineers, and focusing particularly on getting permission to construct a levee systems within the, the north side of Minot so that they can avoid flood insurance requirements and prevent a similar flood from devastating their community again. So I mentioned the initial sponsor for the project was the Water Commission. They hired a team of consultants led by Barr to define a project. They wanted to provide the community with a way to, to rebuild. So we started with a, a stakeholder workshop. We got together with the community. We discussed their priorities. We had FEMA, the Corps, counties, everybody in the room. From that, we developed initial concepts and released them for public comment. Based on that feedback, we developed preliminary alignments. Those were further refined and resulted in a, a preliminary engineering report on Leap Day. The preliminary engineering report delivered in, in February 2012 defined a project that included levees and flood walls with three feet of freeboard above the flood of record. It was really important to the community that they be able to withstand a similar flood in the future. The plan needed to minimize loss of housing. This disaster had occurred right in the midst of the shale oil boom in North Dakota. Housing was at a premium. They were building temporary housing all over the place and then this flood happens and they lose 4,000 homes. 
community didn't want to lose any more if they could help it. The project also needed to improve transportation connectivity. During the flood, only two bridges were open, which caused major delays getting from one side of the river to the other. We needed to make sure that there were no adverse impacts on the base flood profile. And this was complicated by changes in hydrology for the, the FEMA maps. And most importantly, we needed to define what the footprint of a, a structural project was going to be. The residents needed to know where buyouts were going to happen and where they could rebuild. They wanted to come back, but they needed to know if their property was going to be within the project footprint or not. Major elements for the project included 22 miles of levee, three miles of flood walls, 30 transportation closures, and 33 pump stations. It also included two high flow diversions. Part of the strategy for minimizing loss of housing was to construct diversions that bypassed certain segments of, of the community, being able to put in closure structures here on the river on the upstream and downstream side of the Ramstead Loop enabled us to, to minimize the number of buyouts that would have otherwise been required if we tried to construct levees on both sides of this meandering channel. The total project cost was on the order of a billion dollars with 800 million being designated for urban areas and 180 million for rural. Much of the cost of the project was land and easements, but the levee and flood walls and closures for the project were, were significant as well. As the community began to implement this project, one of the first things that they did was look for funding options. And one of those funding sources was a community development block grant. The community was able to get $74 million to fund buyouts. And this was beneficial for the project for a couple of reasons. One, it was able to take some of the areas that were um, less densely populated and would be expensive to include within the project. They were included in that preliminary engineering report, but take some of those communities, those, those neighborhoods and, and do buyouts. So these are the three buyout neighborhoods that were funded by that grant. FEMA was an important player for a variety of reasons. Uh, initially, right after the flood, the community applied for a, an HMGP grant that was used to construct a flood wall for their water treatment plant. During the flood, they were able to flood fight and they kept the water treatment plant from being inundated, but it was touch and go. And the community used this HMGP grant to give themselves better security for their drinking water supply. Soon after the 2011 flood, FEMA initiated a risk map update for Ward County and the city of Minot. And the study's ongoing, but one of the major changes from this study is the updating of the 1% annual chance discharge. A review of the hydrology found that the 1% chance discharge is not 5,000 CFS as it had been, but 10,000 CFS. As you can imagine, by doubling the flow for the base flood through town, many more homes would be affected and the flood insurance requirements for a community that was just devastated by a major flood would compound insult to injury. To make sure that the project takes into account this new information, these new maps, we made sure that FEMA was at the table early. We had coordination with Region 8 and got concurrence with them that the clomers that we submit for the different project design elements are based on those preliminary maps rather than the effective maps. By designing the system to, to the 10,000 CFS level instead of the 5,000 CFS level, we're designing for the future, not something that will soon be outdated. Here are some screenshots from that one 
percent annual chance effective maps with the 5,000 CFS. The floodplain is actually fairly wide, but most of that is zone X, meaning that there are no flood insurance requirements. The zone AE areas are largely confined to the channel. The preliminary maps show that much of that area will be zone AE. The blue areas will will require flood insurance unless the community does something to remove those areas from the floodplain. And that is what the project plans to do. The first design elements to be constructed, designed and constructed are, are these. There's Napa Valley flood wall, levee and flood wall system here, the forest road levee system here, the HMGP grant was used to develop or build the flood wall for the water treatment plant and the fourth avenue flood wall at the same time that the city was in designing and constructing these elements the north dakota department of transportation has since replaced the broadway bridge and the 83 bypass bridge these bridges were both open during the flood but they've been reconstructed um, this bridge widened so it has greater capacity uh, and that was coordinated with the overall project. The next elements to, that are in design now are the Chiracita Vallejo levee system that will be going to construction soon. Maple diversion design which is which is that high flow diversion and then the 4th Avenue tieback levy. The project is being designed to meet FEMA certification requirements. Because the system is being designed to 27,000 CFS rather than the typical 1% chance flood at 10,000 CFS, we tend to have plenty of freeboard. We have three feet above 27,000 CFS. Of course, the system is also being designed to meet geotechnical stability and interior drainage requirements. Uh, of certification. This map shows the future zone AE floodplain once the North Minot levee system has been constructed. By doing this, the community will keep 3,250 structures from having flood insurance requirements, which will save the community a considerable amount. FEMA is not the only federal partner. Much of the coordination that's happened with the design and permitting of the project has been with the Corps of Engineers, both in terms of making sure the community stays in PL 8499, so they are eligible for repair funding if their levees are damaged in a flood, but also for modifications to the system through Section 408 and regulatory approval through Section 404. After the 2011 flood, the Corps evaluated its levee systems and found that all eight levee systems had significant deficiencies. And they informed the community that if they didn't address these deficiencies, then their status in PL 8499 was threatened. After the 2011 flood, the Corps of Engineers evaluated the existing levee systems and identified deficiencies in all eight of those systems. And they informed the community that their status in PL 8499 was in jeopardy if they didn't fix these. <clears throat> deficiencies were classified depending on how urgent they were and um, whether they were maintenance or not. Based on the deficiencies, the community developed a SWIFT or system-wide improvement framework for addressing the deficiencies. In the SWIFT, the community identified interim risk reduction measures. They developed a schedule for completing the actions needed to address the deficiencies, and they developed a budget for those planned improvements of nearly $11 million. These actions taken to address the deficiencies were given categories from routine maintenance to capital improvement projects and encroachment obstruction removal, as well as future and existing flood protection improvements. 
The first one, routine maintenance. This is something the community is doing already, going through and addressing vegetation and other maintenance issues. A lot of the capital improvement and, and structural changes will be addressed as part of the larger flood control project. A big part of the permitting for this project was the section 408 approval. The federal government gives the Corps of Engineers the authority to grant permission for someone to modify a civil works project, a project funded by the federal government, as long as it's not injurious to the public interest and it won't impair usefulness. Meaning the federal government invests in a levy system. The Corps needs to make sure that somebody coming in to modify that isn't going to to damage it, make it less useful, and waste taxpayer dollars. Prior to 2018, this process involved developing at least a 60% design, submitting it to district for review, getting an independent external peer review, or IEPR, and then submitting for additional reviews at the division and headquarter level within the Corps of Engineers. This process could take years. I said until 2018. In 2018, September 2018, the Corps of Engineers updated its, its engineering curricular to define the Section 408 process and made some simplifications. First, they delegated all decisions from headquarters down to, to lower levels. So now the district has authority for Section 408 decisions. They reduce the number of activities that are required for Section 408 permission. They stipulated that there, there's going to be one decision for both the 408 and 404 approvals. So the, the environmental regulatory approval and the, the civil works modification approval. These Approvals can be through multi-phased review of projects, and they eliminated the need for that 60% minimum design requirement. These and other changes to the 408 process are summarized in a fact sheet. You can access that fact sheet with the link at the bottom of the screen here. But this was in 2018. We started this process back in 2015. And in some ways, the Mouse River project was, was the guinea pig for the Corps. This is how they explored what it meant to, to make these revisions to the 408 process. And in two and a half years, we were able to get a programmatic 408 and EIS approved and the authority for district to approve future submissions or future phases um, granted to the St. Paul district. So where is the project now? We talked earlier about the different phases for the North Minot levee system. This map shows the yellow highlighted area for the North Minot system. Future systems will be the South Minot system in blue and the East Minot system in green. I mentioned that there are two high flow diversions, the Maple diversion and the 27th Street diversion. Uh, right now, the 4th Avenue flood wall has been constructed, as have Napa Valley and Forest Road and the water treatment plant. Terracita will go into construction this year. Maple Diversion and the East Highback will hopefully follow next year. Going back to our project timeline, lots of parallel processes as we've gone through this. There was some initial planning phases. Fortunately for the community, the risk map process is still ongoing. So the flood, insur flood insurance requirement has not yet kicked in. We're hopeful that we can complete the North Minot levee system before or soon after the, the new maps become effective. Once that happens, we'll will move on to the design and construction of future phases defined by the project. I mentioned earlier that the Maple Diversion is still in design. One reason for that is that the Corps of Engineers 
has conducted a feasibility study to see if there is a federal interest in the project. They did find that there is a benefit cost ratio greater than one, and they are awaiting congressional approval and appropriation to continue uh, with the design of this project. If they get that funding, then they may uh, lead the design and a local sponsor will contribute uh, a portion of the, of the cost to that design. Outside of Minot, there are several levy segments, including Burlington, which has been designed and will go into construction this year. Brooks Edition, Country Club Acres, these are rural levy segments. Uh, the city of Sawyer and the city of Velva each have levy segments. These segments will be designed in, in future years. They weren't as high priority because they were able to flood fight successfully during the 2011 flood, but it was similar to the water treatment plan. It was touch and go and they need improvements made to their system. Another firm is doing the design of, of bridge replacements for these two communities. With a big project like this, with a big price tag, funding is always a question. The local community has set up a local sales tax to, to fund what they can for the project. Much of the funding is coming from the state. North Dakota State Water Commission has uh, budgeted for these types of projects as they are able to demonstrate need. This money has been coming from taxes on shale, oil, uh, extraction, and with the current price of oil and the economy and uncertainty, it's an open question as to whether that funding will be sustainable in the years to come. There has been federal funding through the NDRC grant and HMGP grants, the, uh, and then the Corps of Engineers also is looking to see if they can uh, get funding to do the design and construction of this maple diversion piece. So lots of different funding mechanisms uh, are needed to make a big project like this work. And as I mentioned in the beginning, there are so many different stakeholders involved in this process and it would not be a successful project if there wasn't collaboration, if there wasn't coordination across these different entities. The North Dakota State Water Commission was instrumental in getting this started, defining a plan that the community supported. And um, once that was done, the Source River Joint Board took over as the local sponsor. This, this joint board is a, has representatives from the city of Minot and the counties where Mouse River passes through as it comes from Saskatchewan back to Manitoba. And the DOT has been supportive with their transportation projects. Right now, one of the biggest challenges we face is, is getting buy-in from the two railroads in town. They are concerned about what impacts the project might have on their facilities. Uh, CP Rail in particular right now is, is concerned about a new bridge that we meet, would need to be constructed over the Maple Diversion. That concludes my presentation. There is more information about the project at the website mouseriverplan.com. This is what we use for community engagement. At this time, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Joe. We really appreciate your presentation. And we do have several questions. The first one's from Brad. For the high flow diversion section, it looked like the flow section had gates to cut off flow to it during high flows. Are these gates automatic based on an elevation for manual, manually operated? Good question. So the high flow diversion would be activated at about the 10 year flood event. It would have to, I'm sure it could be automated. Those river closure structures haven't been constructed yet. Um, but the idea is that once about 3,000 CFS is coming through town, if the flood forecast is for higher flows, then that water 
the, the river closure structures would be shut and water would be diverted through that high flow diversion. Okay, um, can you talk about the potential risk if future projects are not completed? Uh, that's, that's a good question. So the, the first phase, that North Minot levee system will uh, protect most of the homes that were flooded in 2011. Um, with the economic uncertainty right now, you know, the, how long it will take to construct the other pieces um, that could potentially put the southern and eastern parts of, of Minot at risk. Uh, the, the full project does raise flood elevations. When you constrict the flood plain like that, it, it does raise them. Um, by not constructing those other elements, it, it will be lower. Uh, I, I, at the 27,000 CFS flood level, I think the risk would increase for those unprotected areas if they those levees are not built. Okay, thank you, Joe. And the next presentation is titled Community, Education, Outreach, and Success Stories for Levees. The main presenters are Brian Cooper and Leslie Scarden, with Susan Vermeer as a, present, a presenter support. Brian Cooper is an emergency management specialist in the engineering services branch of FEMA headquarters. Leslie Scarden provides communication strategy and support to the FEMA Community Engagement and Risk Communication, also known as CERC, contract. And Susan Vermeer works at FEMA headquarters as a senior levy subject matter expert. Please welcome Brian, Leslie, and Susan. Hi, Brian Cooper here to discuss uh, community education outreach, success stories for levies. I am a levy mapping program person at headquarters working with Suzanne Vermeer on lots of levy related policy mapping issues and also success stories. So when we, when we have identified perhaps an issue across the country, we help provide policy or guidance that gets to a resolution and turns into a success. So through the course of, of all that over the last several years, we developed a lot of uh, tools, a lot of templates, a lot of best practices, and also success stories that we like to share. We have them housed on, on our website. And so this presentation is a, is a discussion of all that and to provide those helpful resources. And Suzanne Vermeer is my colleague here at headquarters. Next slide. I am Brian Coper. This is me. Next slide. And I'm joined today with Leslie Scarden, our CERC team support person, uh, who's an expert in all the communications, that, community engagement, outreach materials that we have and we've developed working through our, our regions and with our communities across the country over the last several years. So she's on today and is going to cover a lot of the meat of the presentation and take you through uh, some of the details and, and what we really have to showcase for today. And so this slide is talking about the goals, uh, primarily two goals, as I mentioned earlier, uh, to discuss some of the strategies that we have, what we've learned, and to share those with you. And so let you know what resources are available uh, for communities, for regions across the country. So these are, these are for national use and we hope that they'll be helpful. Great, thanks Over Brian. So this is, this is Leslie. I'll walk us through the next couple of slides here. We wanted to start by talking a bit about the risk communications and risk map playbook. Um, this is a tool for FEMA staff, providers, and CTPs that drives FEMA's engagement strategy and work with different communities. And the goal of this internal resource is really to provide a more consistent approach for FEMA's community engagement and risk communications, provide those communication best practices really enhance outreach with community officials. And as we've um, gone through this contract and work with FEMA, uh, the, the playbook itself has evolved too, to provide 
guidance to FEMA staff and providers on a couple of different topics. So we now have um, five different chapters of this. The first goes over risk communications and risk map broadly. The second talks about um, engagement through risk map. The third uh, focuses specifically on local elected officials and engaging them. Our fourth chapter is on coastal communities. And that fifth chapter is on uh, risk communication for communities with levies. And so we created this levy specific chapter because levies have their own set of engineering considerations, which adds some complexity to how we talk about levies and how we um, communicate with them. And so at a high level, this chapter explains that what FEMA does, how you communicate the risk associated with levies. It goes over best practices for community engagement and really seeks to simplify how we communicate about some of these complex topics and engineering pieces. So it's a, almost a 40 page document um, meant for our internal FEMA staff and providers that really at a high level looks at, you know, what is a levy system? Who are the players? Uh, who does what? What do we mean by risk communication? How do we map those flood hazards? How do we talk about levies and risk? How do we do community engagement? And then how do we also build resiliency? And so we really want folks to, to use this internally to increase their understanding of FEMA's role with respect to levies, how that intersects with the roles of other agencies, how to effectively communicate, and then those best practices. We'll go over this message platform. Um, again, this is an internal facing resource, but we share it today because we think it's really important to inform how FEMA and providers talk about levies and talk about risk communication. Um, and this will, these messages are carried through the tools and templates that we'll discuss later on. But for this message platform, what we do is we really start in the middle in this stronger together message that informed communities are better equipped to understand their flood risks and take actions to reduce and manage those risks. It's really one of our main goals in levy risk communications. And then how you use this platform is we'll go from our, our top left and go um, around clockwise. So we start with what, what are the levy impacted areas? So we know levies are a critical part of our infrastructure, but we also know that they don't eliminate flood risk in its entirety and that there are millions of Americans and trillions of dollars in assets located behind levies that are still vulnerable to that flooding. And then we talk about some of the risks and realities so that while Levies can reduce some flood risk, they don't eliminate risk. And in some cases, they actually increase the risk um, as communities develop behind those levies because they think they have kind of this false sense of safety or security. And that's a really important message, right? Levies don't protect you from risk. They can reduce some risk, but they certainly don't eliminate it. So that's why we have tools to help us look at that risk. Um, flood risk change over time. And while FEMA doesn't design, build, maintain, inspect, or certify levies, we do use that latest data about flood hazards and levy conditions to create flood risk products. And these maps are tools that help provide a more precise, up-to-date picture of the flood hazards so communities can help uh, plan and understand that risk and take action to reduce that risk. So then as we move forward, we want to move forward as partners um, with FEMA, the Army Corps, the levy sponsors, the community, and use those maps to identify actions to support effective flood risk management. And we know that, you know, people don't necessarily like higher insurance rates or more restrictive building codes, but often both are necessary to help reduce that hazard to lives and property. And FEMA and our partners are committed to helping communities take steps to minimize that flood risk and maximize resilience. So these again are the key messages that we pull through a lot of our documents and we would encourage you um, to, to think about these as you communicate levy risk in, in your communities as well. So let's move on to the tools and templates. So these are um, public facing documents that are ready for your use. And they were really informed by the playbook. So we spent some time talking about the playbook because that playbook chapter really helped inform what tools we created. 
And so what we did is we uh, actually did interviews with each of the FEMA regions and their CERC liaisons and mitigation champions to determine what tools they need. So the playbook provides that set of internal guidelines and communications considerations, but how do we bring those to life? And so we created a list of documents and we received feedback um, via regional workshops that we did to really talk about, you know, are these the right tools and templates? Are these the right documents to help us um, thrive and help really support regional engagement? So what are these? These, um, these documents use the principles of behavioral science and explain difficult concepts in plain language with easy to understand visuals for non-technical audiences. And the goal of these is to bring that greater consistency, continuity, and efficiency to community engagement uh, with levy mapping projects. So again, using that message platform we reviewed as a frame to, um, to streamline how we talk about levies and help simplify some of these processes and bring that greater consistency. So we're gonna go over um, briefly some of these publicly available documents. We also have um, internal facing documents that are meant to be used by FEMA staff and providers. Um, so meeting invitations, meeting decks, um, some community timelines and checklists that internal FEMA staff and providers use when preparing for those community outreach meetings. But it's also really important to us that we have these public facing resources um, that anyone can use. These are all on FEMA.gov and we'll share that link down the line. Um, but it's important that we you know, get this information out there in easy to understand terms. So we have a, a levies and insurance fact sheet. So we suggest that this be a leave behind at a community or, or local levy partnership team meeting. And this provides additional background on flood insurance and levies to those key stakeholders who are really involved in the decision making process. So we know there are a lot of considerations when it comes to insurance, but this looks specifically at levies and insurance. We have a similar fact sheet that looks specifically at zone D and levies. There are a lot of questions around zone D um, when it comes to levy mapping. And so again, this can be helped, uh, this can be used to help explain some of those complex issues um, and can be used to guide those conversations around risk and insurance at these community meetings. We also developed two risk and mitigation fact sheets. And when we think about levy mapping, you know, it's not just about the engineering. Um, it's not just about what is the map. It's communicating that there is risk and talking about mitigation. So it's taking it a step further beyond just creating a map to talking about how we use the map and what steps we can actually take to reduce our risk. So this first one is designed for property owners and has specific mitigation ideas that a property owner could take. And then our next one is for community officials. So it has some broader mitigation ideas around how a community can reduce their risk. We also developed a, um, a larger document on commonly used terms and acronyms for levy systems. So we know that there can be a lot of um, abbreviations and acronyms and um, engineering speak when it comes to levy mapping, especially at these community meetings. And so we designed this document to be given um, as a handout during some of those community or LLPT meetings. So stakeholders can keep track of, of um, what's being talked about and have a better sense of the conversation. Um, it's kind of a cheat sheet that they can go back to and reference. And then the final set of documents here for the fact sheets are updated levy analysis and mapping procedures fact sheets. So we have a set of these documents online that are really aimed towards a more technical audience, but these are um, really focused more at the community level to help an LLPT uh, group understand what all these different procedures are. And they also have updated visuals to help visually explain these five procedures of natural valley, freeport deficient, structural base inundation, overtopping, and sound reach. These are also online um, to help folks really understand what those procedures mean and what's best for their community. We also designed a series of infographics that are also publicly available. So this first one is stakeholder engagement for the levy analysis and mapping procedures uh, for non-accredited levy systems. And this is a 
a pretty detailed visual infographic that goes through what the levy analysis and mapping procedures process is and looks at those opportunities for community engagement and highlights some best practices. We also created what we're calling the at a glance version of this one. So that's the one page version that's not quite as detailed, um, but is abbreviated and simplified to help those non technical audiences kind of understand where they are and where they're going when their community is undergoing um, the mapping procedures process. And then that third infographic is specifically for flood hazard mapping projects with levy systems. So it helps the community visualize um, the different mapping approaches available to them if a flood map project includes a levy system. So we'll take a quick look at this at a glance version. Um, it fits on a large piece of paper. So we've chopped it into two sections here to fit on one side. But you'll see at the top, we give a little bit of background about you know, how many levies there are in the nation, um, who FEMA works with, what a levy can look like, we talk about the roles, so that there are lots of parties involved um, when it comes to flood risk communication. And then we talk about one of the first steps you'll take when you go into this process, which is that community information and coordination. So the importance of working with community, federal, state, and local partners to collect data on the levy and to make sure that we're collaborating and working together. We'll then go into that kickoff meeting where FEMA meets with the levy sponsor and other community stakeholders. We'll form that local levy partnership team. We'll do that first meeting when we talk about those five uh, levy analysis and mapping procedures, and we'll get feedback and information and talk through next steps. We'll then go through the data collection and analysis for FEMA develops that plan um, to look at the different procedures and get input from that local levy partnership team and actually perform the mapping analysis. You'll look at the, the results of that and discuss the, the draft maps and get feedback. And then we'll move into that preliminary map and regulatory process where the analysis is integrated into that firm. And this graphic that you'll see here is an example of what we like to show as residual flood risk. So as a reminder that you know we can do a lot of different um, things, we can take a lot of different mitigation steps. But at the end of the day, flood risk is always there. And so it's really important that as we move into step eight, that building resiliency, that we remember to continue to identify and implement those mitigation actions. But flood risk does not stop at a line on a map. So the other set of resources we have available are success stories. And these tell the story of efforts by a community, a FEMA region, a CTP, or a mapping partner to increase resilience. And so one of FEMA's priorities is to highlight and share those successes with the public. Um, and we believe there's significant value in documenting those, right? It provides helpful information and resources to our communities and partners, and it simplifies processes by learning from each other's work. So the goal of these is really to capture successful community engagement, and that can help in, uh, create innovation and streamline and replicate those best outreach practices. And these are really meant to highlight a variety of different successes. This can be about mitigation. It can be about the levy analysis and mapping process. It could be about stakeholder partnership and collaboration. Um, so it can be about a lot of different um, successes. It doesn't just have to be about completing a mapping process, but the ultimate goal is to help people better understand that risk and mitigation. So we featured two here. Um, we have a region four one on uh, the focus on dams. So this one really highlights efforts and results to increase compliance with emergency action plans in Georgia. And then we have a region nine one um, it's based in Coachella Valley, California. So it's actually um, the first community in the country to implement the levy analysis and mapping procedures for those non-accredited levy systems. So we'll um, also share the link with you for where to find these. But again, these are really great stories. Um, you can see we've highlighted lessons learned and best practices and have different visuals as well. So the most important thing, how to access. Um, these are all on FEMA.gov. If you go to the levy tools, templates, and success stories for community outreach, we have uh, what we call a document container that hosts all these different 
um, stories. So we can copy down this link to the FEMA DACA Media Library Assets Documents 18-27-27, um, or you can just Google the Slevy Tools Templates and Success Stories for Community Outreach, and those PDFs can be downloaded from there. I'm going to turn it back over to Brian to close us out. Thank you, Leslie. So part of this process in collecting success stories is that uh, we know that there are more out there and we know that there are the best practices we have today uh, can continue to get better with the future. So uh, as future mapping projects go on, as, as future uh, studies occur, and there's more engagement, there's, there's more to learn. Uh, we want to continue to make these uh, working, living documents. So just because they're up on our website, FEMA.gov, uh, doesn't mean that we can't change them and, and put next iterations and next versions out there or additional. Um, so we're, we're always uh, wanting to revisit these, keep them, keep them the, the best that we can make them. Uh, but that takes uh, input from, from all of us uh, across the country, all of us down and at the working level work with communities. Um, so you'll see there my email address on the screen. So feel free to provide any feedback uh, to me and, and I'll make sure that, that we pass it along to the team and incorporate it as appropriate. And wanted to leave with any questions that you may have uh, or, or comments. So that'll be this portion of the presentation. Thank you, Brian and Leslie. We really appreciate your presentation. And we do have several questions. Um, is the risk communication and risk map playbook available online? Yes, well, it, the risk map playbook is, is a document that was put together uh, for, for FEMA staff primarily, for FEMA regions uh, to provide them the tools when there's a, the project ongoing. Uh, that they have that as a resource. So there's a, the playbook has chapters in it because it's a book. And, and so there's a levy chapter and a coastal chapter. And so we were really focused uh, as a levy program on, on the, levy, the levy chapter. So that, that is mainly a, an internal facing document, but a lot of the products that come out of that um, can be delivered. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of uh, communication materials that the public will see from that. Okay, thank you for that answer, Brian. Um, one more question is, only three CRS communities receive credit in Activity 620 levies. Have y'all developed any outreach materials targeted to local emergency managers? I'm not sure I know the answer to that one. No. This is Leslie from a uh, CERC perspective. Um, we have not so far, um, but these types of conversations are really helpful in understanding what people want and need in the field. So this is something that we can take back um, and run by the regions and see if there's interest in that and could be a potential source of documents that we create in the future. It's a great suggestion, thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Uh, one more, the use of these flood risk maps that show residual risk behind levees are not available to the general public, correct? What maps do you show in the risk communications and risk map playbook? Well, from a mapping program uh, that FEMA is uh, administers with the participating communities, we map uh, flood hazards on a regulatory flood insurance rate map. Now there are other non-regulatory products, which we call flood risk products that could be developed. And that's on a on a case by case basis, community by community basis, even by levy by levy basis. So it, the that's the short answer is that it, it's there's the regulatory products that are on the flood insurance rate map, and then there are the, the flood risk products that can be varied uh, depending on the data available. 
so they can be customized based on data available, based, based on the specific levy system and, and the needs of that community at the time. That's, I think, the best short answer I can give. Okay. And this is Suzanne Vermeer. I'll add to that um, response. Thank you, Brian. Um, as, as Brian mentioned, uh, the risk map playbook is primarily focused on the delivery of our regulatory products, the flood insurance rate map, flood insurance study, as well as our standard uh, non-regulatory or flood risk products. Um, I think specific to the question around the Army Corps and the information that they are developing, um, I think what I would want to share with the, the group is that we are working, Brian and I are working very closely with the Army Corps. Um, we've been working over the last several years to enhance the information in the Army Corps National Levy Database and specifically as it relates to um, the Bigger Waters 12 requirements that Meg Galloway mentioned in the first session, um, mapping areas of residual risk behind levees and um, dams and inundation areas if levees and dams fail. Um, those are all uh, additional important pieces of flood risk information that we are exploring with the Army Corps on how, how best to develop that information uh, in an efficient way nationally and share that with the public because it is important that people do understand those risks, uh, the risks they, they have um, in living in areas um, landward of levees or downstream of dams. So um, I think there'll be a lot more to come on that in the next year or two um, that we can share with folks. But I, I think as much as it's important to stress that there's a lot of information and data out there in the National Levy Database today. Um, I, I think it's important that folks do look at the National Levy Database and see what's there um, with regard to their area of interest. Um, and in addition, we are working with the risk communication side of our house at FEMA and the Corps to, to explore uh, what's the most effective way to communicate that information to a variety of stakeholders, such as community planners, floodplain managers, emergency managers. So um, there's a lot, a lot we're exploring and look forward to sharing more in the future. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, <clears throat> we do have a comment and one more question, and I, I believe we have time. Uh, is the LAMP procedure used for CLOMARS for the uncredited levy improvements? Yes. So the CLOMARS and LOMARS are are really just a mapping vehicle. So our, our guidance in generally applies uh, uniformly across how we map flood hazards on a flood insurance rate map. So the, the mapping vehicle, there are different different requirements based on the mapping vehicle, whether it's a study or a LOMAR or a CLOMAR. So uh, that's correct. All the LAMP procedures, uh, the three phases would need to be complete prior to submittal to a, a CLOMAR or a LOMAR. Thank you. And the comment is from Carl Walker, who's a former floodplain manager for the city of Roseville, California. Please contact me about the outreach efforts we did for acquiring CRS activity 620 uh, credit back in 2017. So thank you for that comment. And um, thank you, Brian, Leslie, and Suzanne. Great presentation. Yeah. Thank you. So I'd like at, you. This, at this time, I'd like to thank our sponsors and please enjoy visiting the virtual exhibit hall during the breaks and the Wednesday conference plenary presentations from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Today's theme is managing flood risks in the changing world. Thank you. Thank you.